Let me hasten to say that unless you've done something special, we are not watching you. <laughs> we do not have the labor to listen to your phone calls or follow you around unless you've done something special to elicit that. So don't worry about it. Have a great time if you're a visitor to this country. Um, and I guess I need to put small agency into context a little bit, because I'm sure none of you really think $8 billion and 32, 34,000 people is small. The Department of Defense yearly spends just short of $70 billion on uh, research, engineering, and technology acquisition. Our total agency budget is $8 billion that affects everything we do, and most of that uh, is uh, acquisition of things. So I'm not going to talk about a particular technology. I'm going to talk about how we go about acquiring technology and deciding those technologies to invest in. Before I can really get into that, I need to tell you what the FBI is, because if you're at all like me before I was an employee, you think that we're a national police force. That's not true. There are many things police agencies do that we don't do. We have no custodial function. We don't do traffic. We don't respond to domestic complaints. We don't have a dispatch function. Uh, by and large, uh, the, the vast majority of crimes we don't even investigate. Uh, they're state and local matters. So what do we do? I need to uh, address that instead. And of course, I have to figure out which of these controls does what. Brief overview. Uh, first of all, our mission, uh, maybe it's obvious, maybe not, but it's to protect the American people and uphold the Constitution of the United States. We've got investigative priorities, and I don't think that uh, it's obvious that they would be these, but number one is counterterrorism, and it has been for um, the best part of the last 20 years. These priorities haven't changed. Counterintelligence, that is counterespionage. Uh, addressing cybercrime. Public corruption is a critically important thing the FBI addresses. Civil rights investigations, transnational, uh, major uh, national level crime, major white collar crime, and really major violent crime. These are the things that we focus on, not necessarily the things that would be obvious. Um, there's some less well-known responsibilities. Uh, we're the domestic equivalent of the National Security Agency. We operate the lawful uh, communications internet program. All uh, intercepts are done subject to a court order. There are criminal uh, intercepts, a relatively small portion, and national security intercepts, but they all are subject to a court order. Um, we operate the domestic equivalent of the Delta Force. There are situations that can only be resolved with military levels of force, some of them inside the United States, some of them, frankly, with other countries that ask for aid from the United States, where either for legal reasons or political reasons, it's not appropriate to use the military. The FBI provides that capability when the nation needs it. Uh, we're the lead agency for counterterrorism and counterintelligence. Um, we handle uh, weapons of mass destruction, uh, ordnance disposal, uh, if there is a radiological device or a small nuclear device that's discovered in the United States, an FBI agent will either cut the wire and prevent the explosion or be the first one on the scene of the explosion. Similarly, we nationally and internationally have the lead for investigation of chemical, biological, radiological uh, incidents. We have the capability to do that. So a lot of things that you would not necessarily think of the uh, FBI as having any involvement in. And it's pretty obvious that these are high technology uh, areas as well. Uh, I, I show you this uh, wiring chart. It's the obligatory thing, but that's not why I have it in the presentation. This is the headquarters of the FBI. You notice that of the six directorates, that all six of them, including the personnel organization, have some role in acquiring technology or in developing technology. Um, and uh, that little box in yellow off the director's box, the deputy director's box, that's our field organization, which doesn't have any role in developing technology, but makes use of the technology. We're everywhere. We have uh, about 600 locations domestically that you'll find the logo on the building, the uh, phone numbers in the phone book that we want you to know where it is. And if there's a an appropriate incident that you can get in touch. So we have a national presence. We also have an international presence. We've got an active presence in the world with FBI offices in about 75 countries that 
do liaison uh, in the uh, legal area with uh, international partners. We've got a presence in every continent except Antarctica. Not a whole lot goes on in Antarctica of relevance to the FBI. So with that uh, commercial on who we are and what we do, let me talk then about technology and innovation at the FBI. I hope that gives you some reason why we would need to care about technology and innovation. Um, I don't have a good quote from our current director. He's uh, only been in place for a couple of years, but I've got a quote from his uh, predecessor where uh, he said uh, in front of one of the oversight uh, hearings that it's the cornerstone to fulfilling our mission as well as creating efficiencies. And that's really true. It's that significant for us. We have a process that we follow, and I won't take you through this complicated wiring chart, but of actually in an organized way looking at what are the challenges we face, what are the systems that we have, how effective are they, how well are the investments we're uh, making performing and, and uh, contributing. And we go through this on an annual basis of re-examining where we're having gaps, where we have needs, and uh, do we think that there's something that we can realistically do about it at this time. Normally, usually, we're an early majority technology adopter. Uh, we try, and if you think about it with the kind of responsibilities we have, many of them don't really lend themselves to being at the leading edge or the bleeding edge of uh, technology adoption. So when it's possible, we'll adopt early majority technology. Why? Well, first of all, we operate in a framework of law and policy. Uh, during the introduction, the uh, um, chair indicated that technology is moving at a blindingly fast pace, and that's actually true. The law and the policy with which uh, government agencies, particularly government agencies uh, with uh, investigative responsibilities, law enforcement responsibilities, public safety responsibilities, don't react with that kind of blinding speed. We're subject to the will of the people through their elected representatives. Uh, of late, they don't seem to be even able to pass budgets. But even when they're efficiently operating, the policy and the law doesn't change quickly, and that affects how quickly we can adopt new technologies. I'll give you an example later on of a technology that we have on the shelf ready to go, but it requires a change of law before we can actually use it. Our missions, our events, particularly of late, do require us, however, to adapt, to innovate, to deal with new technologies and with changes. So we've got the environment moving incredibly fast, generating more knowledge in the space of a year or two than in all of previous human history. And then we're modulated by law and policy as we look at those things that support our intelligence function as well as our investigative functions. So we do research with a little r. We don't even have a specific budget for R&D. If you look at our Defense Department and some of the other uh, departments, uh, NASA, for example, they have major budgetary line items that the Congress specifically considers that are focused on research. We don't have that. We don't have that separately at all. We conduct prototyping and applied research out of our operational budgets. Uh, we typically are operating at te technology uh, readiness levels three to nine, so we don't do basic research at all. Um, we look at applied research, advanced uh, technology development, prototyping, and system development. And uh, we believe that the capabilities that we have are making successful impacts, which is not the same thing as saying we have everything we need. We have very limited but strongly supported R&D. Since the organizations that use technology have to budget for the change, um, that R&D competes with ongoing operational activities for funding. We've got to have a strong business case to devo uh, justify diverting funding to uh, research and development. Uh, stronger still, if there has to be research, that this is not something that has been demonstrated in the literature to already exist. Uh, better yet, been demonstrated by somebody else is working and suitable for adoption. Uh, if a large effort is going to be publicly visible, well, our management is deeply engaged in this because they're going to have a hard time explaining why we spent a lot of money on a large effort if it's not successful. 
So we don't really have the traditional valley of death between early investigation and transition into operation. If we invest in it, we're going to use it if it's successful. So there's some precepts that we follow. Early majority commercial off-the-self technology adoption where possible. And I'm going to talk about each of these five briefly. Leverage partner investments when commercial items won't support our mission. What that means is get somebody else to spend their money developing it. Uh, sometimes that won't work. We'll jointly sponsor investments. Typically what we like to provide is intellectual capital rather than actual financial capital, but we, we provide money as well. Um, as you get down to core mission areas that no one else is interested in, or at least at the time that is critical to us, we start sponsoring research, and in some cases, we actually do our own research. And I will give some examples of that as well. So early majority uh, adoption. You've all seen the Gartner hype cycle chart, so I won't take you through the complexities of it, other than to point out that as you go through the Enovision trigger, people get excited. There's tremendous interest in it, a lot of excitement. It doesn't work out. Companies leave the field and so on. We try where we can to avoid all that and wait until it's a proven technology that we can just buy and use. No, that doesn't always work. I mean, that's a great strategy if you can follow it. We have a lot of partners that we can leverage their funding that have similar problems, perhaps not the exact same problems, but similar problems. There's a lot of activity in this space. One of our principal problems is the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Um, part of the FBI men has been actively working with NIST since 1963. Their records only go back to 1967, but it's actually 63. Uh, and that was actually for fingerprint technology that uh, we started working with them. We work with DARPA. We work with uh, the intelligence uh, advanced research projects activity. They spend considerable in uh, areas that are related to us, the service laboratories, lots of others. Uh, the National Science Foundation has sponsored a number of things for us. Um, many universities we work with, we're part of uh, an NSF uh, center, the Center for uh, Identification Technology and Research. Uh, we're one of the funding uh, partners in that. We work with industry. They have uh, industry-sponsored research and development programs which we try to take advantage of, and, and we're one of the uh, Incutel affiliates, which many of you out here in Silicon Valley will be familiar with. Sometimes we have to develop things, and this is an example. In fact, this is the example I mentioned, that it works. Uh, we actually came up with the idea behind this. This is uh, DNA analysis, uh, law enforcement really, law enforcement national security DNA analysis that ideally would be done at the time of arrest in a police booking station. About half the states uh, and the federal government um, either allow or require the collection and analysis of DNA at the time of arrest. It's actually a legal requirement for all federal arrests, and about the half the states require it as well. Um, historically, what that has meant is collecting a swab, mailing it to a laboratory, waiting for it to get through the laboratory's uh, processing queue. Once it actually goes into processing, it normally takes about three days. Those of you in the field know that you can really do it in six to eight hours. But the logistics of it don't really allow you to do that unless you're willing to take everything else out of processing, possibly destroy the samples to do a rush job on something. So very long delays historically. What this was intended to do was to be done in a police booking station at the time of arrest and before a release determination was made. Normally in about two hours, most places in the United States. The police do not want to hold you in jail. Those who watch crime shows and think that they're arresting people on pretext, you know, that may happen some obscure jurisdiction, but as a practical matter, they don't have the labor. It costs money to feed prisoners and to clean the cells and whatnot. So even if they arrest you, you're going to be out in a couple of hours unless it's on a Friday night and you probably won't get out until Monday morning when the magistrates come to work. This was to happen in two hours. It, with a whole bunch of partner agencies, we invested in developing this technology. We started in about 2007, wrote a contract in 2009, had a working device in uh, 2012. It turned out that this was incredibly complicated. Um, 
Everyone has been talking about laboratory on a chip for the best part of 30 years. It, however, didn't really work for a lot of uh, processes until relatively recently. It works very well now, and many of these processes work dramatically faster at micro and nano scale than they do at macro scale. So the, uh, and the FBI put about $2 million into this. The rest of the community put another $18 million into this. And industry put about $200 million into this. Uh, there's, there's another device that we didn't help fund, but that uh, is part of the additional investment. So with all that leveraging, we got an awful lot out of a relatively small financial investment. We made a large investment of intellectual capital and got that device. Now, I know it, it looks awfully crude and rough and like a prototype, but it's not. It's actually commercially sold and it's sold internationally. We can't use it in a police station today, uh, even though it works and it works fine, because the way the federal law is written, uh, you can only process DNA in an accredited DNA laboratory, and police stations are not accredited laboratories. So Senate Bill uh, 2348 has been passed united, unanimously by the U.S. Senate. It's been reported out of committee unanimously in the House of Representatives. And uh, right now, GovWatch gives it about a 3% probability that the House will take it up and pass it this year. And if he does, if they do, the president will sign it. And if not, it'll start all over again next year. So this is an example of uh, that while technology moves fast, in this case, it didn't move as fast as we would have liked, policy and law doesn't move so fast. But, but it's on the shelf, ready to go, when and if. Mission critical investment. The FBI has been responsible for operating the National Fingerprint Repositories for 92 years, since 19, May of 1924. Um, most of the time it's been done in an intensely manual fashion. Um, and you can do that, but you can't do it timely. In fact, uh, what caused me to go to work for the FBI was the opportunity to be the chief engineer and eventually the deputy program manager building the uh, automated uh, national fingerprint system. I never imagined I'd spend 20 years. I figured I'd be there for three or four years and move on to the next thing. I just found it interesting. But it turns out that this is a very difficult problem in pattern matching. It's not a difficult problem today, you know, because we invested in it for 25 years and commercialized it, and multiple companies are now doing it. The system that we have today uh, is actually a commercial system that we're able to buy and adapt. Now, we're doing it on a scale that's much larger than most others, and so it's very expensive. We've invested over the years about $2.5 billion in fingerprint pattern matching technology, and it's phenomenally good today. Uh, it's 99.6%. Uh, reliable with a false drop rate of 0 0.00103. However, uh, by adding humans into this and a lot of complexity I won't get into today, essentially our, our false positive rate is unmeasurable. It's, uh, we've got a Six Sigma program and it's 99.96 and frankly we can't measure it below that. We do about 200,000 10 print checks a day. Um, which means, uh, with all those wonderful numbers I've just quoted to you, probably not want more than one or two wanted persons a day get missed. So as good as it is, it needs to be better. But another presentation. We've been investing in mission-critical biometric research in a variety of ways, with fingerprints, with DNA, with face recognition. Uh, we have a number of R&D programs with uh, uh, olfactory that are not on the slide. We're interested in uh, handwriting analysis and a number of other things. So these are things that we invest in because largely nobody else will outside of academia and the academic focus is often not what we're interested in. So we will do R&D ourselves if we have to, but we prefer to buy it from somebody else. Acquiring technology is a dilemma for the government. Large companies, and most of the companies making things or selling things are large companies, tend to incrementally invest in technology. Even at big companies like IBM tend to incrementally invest in improvement rather than disruptive technologies that completely change the trajectory. Government is no longer a major source of technology. Now, it has been in the past, uh, but, but not so much anymore. 
Um, so the large commercial endeavors are not developing capabilities against our more obscure requirements because there's not a large market for it. Sources of R&D funding have changed over the years. Some of this audience are old enough to realize that uh, there was a time that it was highly questionable if there would ever be a commercial computer industry. The, uh, the federal government invested massive amounts of money in it. Much of it was classified at the time, but uh, magnetic core memory, semiconductor memory, rotational memories, they all came about as a result of government investment. Well, there's essentially, other than in uh, really large-scale high-end computing, there's very little government investment in computer technology today. That's become a consumer application, an industrial application. If we need something outside the normal, it's probably not going to come about naturally as a result of uh, any kind of commercial activity. You can see the federal investment in R&D has dramatically gone down while industry, university, nonprofit is uh, what's dominating investment today. To put this in a slightly different perspective, uh, it's not my slide, but, uh, but I think it tells a, a good story. Uh, that column on the, uh, the left in red is essentially the entire defense industry, all the major companies that do R&D and that support defense. And then you have a few well-known companies uh, on the right. Walmart is as big as the entire defense industry. Apple has enough cash on hand that if it were for sale, they could buy the entire defense industry. So, you know, government just doesn't dominate technology anymore. I can remember a number of years ago when the government decided it had to have its own large-scale integration capability, and it would allow industry to bid on this and uh, you know, respond to the government needs. So they put out a request for a proposal, and they got no response at all. Nobody bid on it. So they went back and they talked to all of the major companies, explained, you must have missed it and when we announced it, but uh, we are going to buy large-scale integrated circuits, specialized requirements, we'll tell you all about it. And they didn't get any bids that time either. So we had a further round of discussion elicited, you're just not big enough. We can't afford to devote the intellectual capital and divert it from things that we can make money with. Government had to go buy its own equipment to make large-scale integrated circuits because nobody was interested in making them and selling them to the government. Just not a big enough market. So you have to be innovative. You have to develop, deal with smaller organizations. You do have to foster industry. You have to be receptive to it. As we look at R&D opportunities, we have to look at, is it consistent with law and public policy? If it's not legal, it doesn't matter how well it's going to work. We can't use it. Are there privacy and civil liberties implications? I know out here in Silicon Valley, there may be an element of skepticism as to whether or not the FBI cares about such things. We care very much. Um, there actually are exceptions written into the law that exempt us from portions of uh, the Privacy Act of 1974. Notwithstanding that there are exemptions from the law, we conduct a privacy threshold assessment and in many cases a privacy impact assess assessment on every uh, new development that we do. We don't publish it, but we do it and we send it to, to the Department of Justice for external review. So privacy and civil liberties pervade all of our uh, activities. Can it realistically be introduced? Is there a way to actually build it in? And uh, it turns out in many cases the answer is no. The, for example, a, a very distinguished um, colleague um, came up with a brilliant approach to identification of essentially using synthetic aperture radar to precisely measure the entire skeletal structure of the individual. That would be highly identifying. In the United States, uh, the last time I had somebody run the numbers for me, um, which was in 2009, we arrested and processed people at 24,000 and change different locations. We are not going to introduce synthetic aperture radar at 24,000 different locations at great cost to give us a degree of uh, identification that fingerprints and uh, DNA and 
other technologies already provide. You know, it can't be reasonably introduced. And it wouldn't matter if it were free, it still couldn't be reasonably introduced. Um, does it materially give us a new capability? Would it significantly support some other mission capability that we don't have today? Um, something new and useful. And finally, and probably least, is it cost effective? So as you look at investments, you have to look at the risk of making the investment at least as a government agency that's accountable to the taxpayers for how it spends your money. Are the requirements stable? Do we really know what we want? You know, can we clearly express it in a way that somebody could hope to build for it? And will they stay stable over time? If the answer is no, it's pointless to launch into an R&D effort. Uh, technical risk. Is it realistic to think that the technology being proposed at this time is going to be mature enough to result in something useful? Schedule risk, can we get it when we need it? Will it cost anything like what the projections are? Uh, if you saw in the news this morning, the new Air Force One is projected to cost $4 billion, and the new president, who does know a little bit about airplanes since he has one that he owns, uh, that's a transport category in our global capability aircraft, doesn't think $4 billion is a reasonable price for a new airplane. I don't know, he's probably right. Um, solution transfer risk, even if it can be made to work. Can it be made to work in a field environment by people who really aren't technologists? You know, I showed you the DNA. That equipment actually works more accurately than laboratory equipment. However, laboratory equipment has metrology departments to support it and PhD scientists to interpret it, tell when it's going off base and resubmit and recalibrate. We're talking about having the, um, how shall I say this, the least intellectually capable graduate of the police academy operate the equipment with not more than one hour of training and be successful every time. So there's a significant solution transfer risk even if you can make it work. Can you make it work to that kind of standard? Is your developer, notwithstanding how intellectually brilliant they are, do they have the managerial capability to still be in business long enough to complete the work? And then finally, the mission impact. Is it going to have enough mission impact to justify the cost? So that's all I'm going to say. Uh, I hope it was clearly something completely different, not about a technology, but about how a mid-sized government agency goes about assessing whether or not we'll invest in a technology, whether it's a good use of your money. Thank you. Thank you very much, James Loudermilk.